Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. But if you're new here, my name's Tyler and I just do consistent content and all things related hockey in the HL overall. And we're in for a fun one again today, me along with Stat Boy Steven. Nonetheless, you probably know him by now if you've been watching previous videos on the channel. Great insight regarding a lot of the prospects in the NHL. And he's had the privilege to meeting a lot of these players and interviewing them. Great guy. And we're going to be doing a recap on the entire 2020 NHL draft. So we'll be summarizing really around the first round and beyond, giving our thoughts and comparisons with our latest mock draft that we did around a week ago. It went two hours long. That was a lot of fun. So if you're still interested in checking that out, make sure you do. It was a great time. And we're going to be comparing our mock drafts, our latest ones at least. Um, I'm not going to be involving really my previous ones because they've all been different and really who got closest to being accurate in this year's first round at least and breaking down the entire NHL draft itself and who really came out the biggest winners and losers this was so much fun this entire NHL draft experience was insane really something unprecedented with what we've seen over the past 48 hours but without further ado let's get right into this video all right, Steven, here we are. So when it comes to the NHL draft this year, it was definitely different. Yesterday went on for, I don't even know how long. It was ridiculous. I was live streaming yesterday. I know it started at 1130. I think it went beyond 7 p.m. Eastern time. It was just, I was not expecting it to say the least, but it was a crazy draft. We saw some trades yesterday as well. And that first round was really something special in my mind. I, I was really happy with a lot of these picks very surprised with a lot of these other picks also what are your just initial thoughts on this whole entire 2020 nhl draft in itself um well i mean has it ended yet yeah. it's, it was it was unbelievable how long it took and and yeah i think it i think i went to bed at 1 a.m i did not expect that at all usually day two is like three four hours and i think it took like seven or eight but um i think it's just a result of the situation we're in, uh, having 31 teams connected over uh, Skype or Zoom or, or whatever video conferencing tool they're using, um, it's going to take a little bit longer. But uh, yeah, it was an interesting draft. We saw some guys go higher than expected, and I saw a lot of players go lower than, than almost everyone expected. Uh, some really good players fell to the second round, and I'm kind of... This is why I usually like to have more picks in the second round rather than one pick late in the first because there's so much talent that, that you could grab there. Um, if the Rangers would have had the opportunity to trade down from 22 and get, for instance, 30 and 37, that's, in my opinion, much greater value than what they got now. But this is so probably also the reason why it didn't happen because other teams know this as well. This was a draft with one of the best second rounds I've seen in a long time. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Um, we all knew this draft class was deep, especially on the offensive front. And that was evident with a lot of players that have had some um, very somewhat suspect with their overall game, at whether it's attitude issues or whatever it may be. Um, a lot of players come to mind, and we'll get to them in a second. But when we look at this first round, I have it pulled up for everyone that sees this. You know this by now, though, guys, if you've actually watched the draft. But I'm going to just go down all of them real quick so you guys know exactly what happened here. But, of course, Alexi Lafreniere, number one, Byfield. Stutzla, Raymond, Sanderson, Drysdale, Holtz, Quinn, Rossi, Rossi at nine. Don't don't worry, I'm gonna talk plenty on that. Cole Perfetti at ten. Yaroslav Askarov, Lundell, Seth Jarvis, Holloway, Amrob, Gooley, Reichel, Dawson Mercer, Braden Schneider, um, Shakir Mukamudulin. I I might have said his name wrong. Um, Hendrix Lap uh, Igor Chinikev, um, Lapierre. Tyson Forrester, Connor Zary, Justin Barron, Jake Neighbors, Jacob Perot, Ridley Gregg, Brendan Brisson, Maverick Bork, and Ozzy Weisblatt. A lot of these picks were interesting. Um, I think we're not going to spend an extreme amount of time just on the first round, of course, but um, should we pull up our mock drafts now, or should I just maybe point out some guys that were really surprising thus far? What do you think? Um, well, my claim to fame for the 2020 draft will always be Shakir Mukamadulin. So yeah, I mean, we uh, might as well do that quick. So you guys see obviously who these picks are, and I'm going to show you a quick snippet of both of our latest mock drafts that we discussed and made in our last mock draft video just about a week ago. So here, here now you have Stevens. And let's fix this real quick. 
<laughs> Hold on, uh, just bear with me. Sure. All right, I apologize about that, guys. But now that you see Steven's mock draft up here, and yeah, there were a lot of different picks. Um, I think we could obviously start with having Perfetti at four when he dropped all the way to 10 to the Winnipeg Jets. Um, Rose, uh, Raymond all the way at nine. A lot of people thought Raymond could fall out or really stay in that top five. I, I luckily had him right where he ended up going. But there was a lot of things up in the air about Raymond still. And if you look at a lot, about a lot of these picks, you have Shakir, of course, at 15 in the Maple Leafs. He goes to the New Jersey Devils just five five picks later. I don't think many many people at all had him going in the first round. So that was a great pick by you, of course. And then if you look at some other options here, we have um, Braden Schneider, 14. He ends up going to the Rangers at 19. Hallway went earlier than I think a lot of people expected. Meshek, in which I have him on my same list, didn't even go in the first round, which was really baffling in my opinion. Um, Jack Quinn, of course, you had at 18 when Quinn went to Buffalo at 8. And a lot of other picks here too. Foodie didn't go in the first round. Same thing with Powell. Um, but for the most part, you had a lot of players that, of course, won the first round, just weren't completely accurate. And that's expected with these mock drafts. And now if you look at mine, mine isn't um, too far off from yours. There's some some in particular that really stand out. Um, when you look at mine, I had one through four at accurate. And then when it got to five with Rossi, that's where everything kind of went downhill. We both had Holtz going at six to Anaheim. Obviously, I thought I've always had the idea that Holtz was going to New Jersey. I really just mixed it up for our latest mock draft. And let alone, he still goes to New Jersey. So I was happy to see him go there regardless because it just made perfect sense for them. Um, Askarov, we both had going to New Jersey as well when Askarov did go to the Predators at 11. Um, I had Drysdale dropping to 12, which is one of the first times I did that in a mock draft. Drysdale went to 6 to Anah Anaheim, obviously. Um, we had Gunler both in the first round. I had Gunler at 16. He didn't even go in the first round. He went to Carolina in the second. Um, and then if you look at some other picks I had here, probably one of the most alarming ones is um, Sanderson I had at 10. Uh, you did as well, and he ended up going at 5. That was a big surprise to me. I wasn't fully expecting that, but it makes sense when you look when you look back at it but then we have other guys as well who lap here i did have right at 22 um zary was right around the ballpark at 23 i'm not sure if he exactly went 23 but i'm gonna check in a second um wallander didn't go in the first round i don't believe stranges was the biggest guy for me who i had in this uh first round he didn't go until the fourth round so that was probably the biggest one and marat at number 30 he didn't go in the first round either he won the second round so Going back now to how we originally have things set up. Okay, here we go. Um, when you really look back on everything that transpired now in this first round, um, what what was the biggest surprise to you? Um, the Rangers trading up for a defenseman. It's probably a big surprise for everyone. Um, and also, I think Columbus Blue Jackets are going with a 19-year-old Russian in the first round. You don't really see a lot of 19-year-olds going in the first round uh, a lot the last couple of years. Because um, it means he was he went undrafted a year ago, and usually those players tend to fall a little bit more. Of course, there are exceptions, like Brad Leeson, who at age 20 went in the first round. Uh, and... I keep blanking on the I'm blanking on the name again. Uh, Tanner Pearson, I think, uh, also went in the first round at age 20. But in general, the first round you see them go with 18 year olds. But I think what what shocked me the most is how many older players went in the first round in their draft year. Players that were born between September 16th and December 31st. Yeah, I remember you, you touching on that. Yeah, usually for me, that, that's a little bit of a, a caution. Uh, unless the player is significantly better than others, like Lafreniere or Nolan Patrick was was uh, a consensus one or two pick in 2017. Um, but Philip Hedo is almost a year younger, and he went in the same, same draft. But this year, it's like you know, the, the, all the early birthdays, all the older players in, in, in this draft – that, that were ranked in the first round all went quite high. And that includes Braden Schneider. The Rangers got two of the older players um, uh, in this draft uh, for first-year eligibles in the first round. 
Yeah, no, and and that's exactly right. It is somewhat surprising because there are plenty of scenarios where you see teams actually back off of prospects because they are, say, a year or two ahead than what the average age is in the class. Yeah. Um, so that that's definitely true. I think uh, I'm pretty sure Jack Quinn is 19. So he is one of those guys who really um, could have fell farther given um, his progression this season. You could have made the argument that maybe it went somewhat in hand with the fact of him being at least a year older than some of the other players. But nonetheless, Quinn still goes at eight. And just looking at this draft board as it is right now, a lot stand out to me. It's funny you bring up Columbus with, of course, um, Igor um, Shinikev. It, when the, when um, Kuk and, um, Yarmo Kukalainen, their GM, announced it, no one, and I mean no one, had any clue who this prospect was, whether it was on um, NHL Network or uh, uh, NBC, SN, or even on SN. Sportnet. Yeah, oh, Sportnet. none of them. None of them. They were all just laughing. They had they had no clue. Talk about an off-the-board pick. Um, and when it comes to that pick, I'll just start with that quick because um, I'm not going to break down all of them, obviously. But a lot of teams didn't have him ranked until the 90th to 160. So it's one of those things where I understand the pick. He was clearly coveted high by Kekalainen and the Skying Group in Columbus. But it leaves you wondering, could he have still been available in the second, third, or even fourth round. That's really the biggest question mark that I have when there are such off-the-board picks like that. You know, um, the Columbus said that they had him really on in their top 10, which is just crazy given the different types of scouting we have with these teams where the majority of them, I'm sure, didn't even have him considered in the first round. So that, that was a very interesting pick, to say the least. Um, I think a lot of others that really stand out to me is starting off with Marco Rossi. Um, during my live stream, if anyone was watching that, then you know I was baffled i was worried that he would drop strictly because of his size and let alone he does um cole caulfield very similar situation last year he really could have went higher than what he did caulfield won the middle of the first round last year the montreal canadians and rossi drops all the way to nine when you had multiple teams that could have taken him with the likes of even really starting at the ottawa centers you would think maybe it would be a better connection for him i know you're going for two forwards but Rossi playing for the Ottawa 67s, it just seemed like a perfect scenario. It would be an even easier transition for him, I would think, at least, into the NHL. And he already has plenty of fans and people that he has a following with in the city itself. So them not taking him and going for Sanderson, I don't. I personally didn't see Sanderson going in the top five. I thought it was a. I knew it wasn't out of the realm of possibility, but I didn't love that pick for Ottawa. I don't hate it by any means. I think Sanderson is going to eat minutes and can come in the NHL basically right away. But still, the pure talent and potential Rossi has just baffled me. Minnesota lucked out big time. And I'll, we'll talk about them more because I have a lot to say about their draft in general. But then when you look at, say, other picks, Askarov was a guy who, in one of my previous mock drafts, I had the Predators taking him. So it was nice to see the Preds go for that goaltender, which makes sense. You know, Pecorine is at the, really the end of his career, very similar to Henrik Lundqvist now. Um, UC Soros hasn't been as good as what was expected maybe for this past season. He was kind of up and down at times. And so bringing in a guy like Askarov in three to four years will be huge for the Preds, as I'm sure at that point they will still be in a win-now stage. Um, if you look at some other picks, Holloway at 14 to Edmonton was somewhat of a surprise. Um, I didn't love that pick for Edmonton. I didn't hate it either. I just thought, given the other winners available, I thought Mercer would have been a, a much better fit, in my personal opinion. Um, Perfetti dropping out of the top five to 10. I think that was a huge steal for the Jets there. I love that pick for them. Get, they pretty much got a top, top five talent at number 10. So I thought that was great. Um, and overall, yeah, there really isn't a whole lot else I can say about this first round. Hendricks Lapierre going to 22, where I was hoping the Rangers would go for him. And he still lands at 22, like I predicted. But that's after the Flames traded twice. First, the Rangers move up in the draft to go from um, 22 to 19. Then the Flames trade that 22nd overall pick to the Capitals. And then the Flames just move down to 24 and still get their guy in Connor Zary. But what are your th what are your thoughts on regarding some of these players that say fell or were selected higher, like Jack Quinn, for example? Um, and, and what it tells me is that uh, we as fans look at the draft with different eyes than than general managers. And I'm not going going to go into whether that's a good thing or a bad thing or who's right or who's wrong. Um, I mean, I watch a lot of the European players. I don't even watch them as much as the European scout, the dedicated European scouts do. Uh, teams that have dedicated European scouts like the Detroit Red Wings, the Toronto Maple Leafs, New York Rangers, they have guys who who are at a game almost every other night. Um, 
And in North America, uh, like teams have uh, pro scouts, amateur scouts. Um, there's 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 such a, a a huge network for each team to go over all these players, and each team has their individual list. And the Columbus Blue Jackets having their guy Shinnikov in their top ten or top twelve, yeah, it kind of makes sense that they go for him in the in the early twenties because their next pick was going was in the third round. So. And that's I understand. a fair argument. Yeah, and, and and I understand if they had like the 35th, like an early second round pick, you could argue that maybe they could have waited. But if their next pick is in the third round, then you, you just have to go for it. And if you are confident, if you trust your scouts, then you just go for it. And sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. Like the Rangers have had their misses over the years, but what is not talked about enough by Ranger fans is their hits in the draft. Nobody ever brings up the fact that they picked Chris Kreider instead of Jacob Josephson and Jordan Schroeder. Nobody ever brings that up. Yeah, and no, that's 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 all fair. And I um I think take into account with Columbus at least too is I know that they didn't have plenty of their picks um, this year in part because of what they did the year prior when they really went all in at the deadline, gain uh, Dzingel and Duchesne among others. So that that all that all does bring some clarity to that pick still. So looking back on now, if say they weren't confident that they would land him in the third or at least wouldn't be able to say trade um, for a different pick to select him in the third or fourth round, then I can understand that argument more. Um, neighbors at 26 for St. Louis was a little bit of a surprise to me as well. Um, for St. Louis, I, I didn't necessarily know if he was going to be going in the first round. Um, but I think when it comes to at least on the front in the first round, and we'll discuss as a whole, um, the winners in the first round, I think, um, definitely the wild stand out just getting roasty at nine. I think that's huge for them that he dropped that far. The devils, I, I thought the devils had a fantastic draft let alone in this first round. They got arguably the two best goal scorers in this entire draft class. Um, you know, you can make the argument between Quinn and the likes of Jarvis as well, but the fact that they got Holtz and Mercer and then added a defenseman that, granted, maybe they could have gone in, say, a later round, but there's a reason. They probably had him second on their board with Schneider at first, if I had to assume. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of promise behind Shakir as well. So I thought they had a great draft, and um, you know I was very impressed with them. Uh, who would you say are you the most impressed with out of this first round among the teams? Um, out of the first round, um, well, Ottawa is an obvious one with the yeah. third of fifth overall pick, and then a late pick. Uh, so they got three players. I think the Calgary Flames had a great first round, even though they only uh, got away with Connor Zari, but trading down twice. You know, yeah, adding two third round picks. That was a very yeah, smart move by them. Adding adding some draft capital for the next day. That's that's really good, and it kind of shows you the situation they're in and the path they're going for. I think they're going to to uh, um, um, I think that they're, they're preparing for a rebuild. Uh, and it might not be a full rebuild like we saw other teams do. Maybe they'll try to do a Rangers rebuild like or a retool as we... I as, think they're more on the lines of a retool. I can definitely get on board with you there, yeah. Yeah, and the Rangers went into this draft with two third-round picks. They used one to trade up, and, and now Calgary had that, that additional third-round pick, and they, they used that draft capital in a way that works for them. And... I think I think Calgary is is uh, an under uh, underappreciated winner of the first round. Uh, when going into the draft entirely, for me the winners are probably the Detroit Red Wings, um, the New York Rangers for the number of picks they had. They traded two seventh round picks for a fifth round pick, and they got the players they wanted. Um, and I think the LA Kings. Um, of course, having the second overall pick, but also what they did after that, getting Halbert Grants. Um, they traded a late second rounder for Elias Anderson, which for Ranger fans might not sound great for the Kings, but you know they get a they get a a player with draft capital that was drafted in the top ten. That, that the talent is there in their eyes. Uh, they have people close to him, so they have maybe a better understanding of what needs to be done with him. And it cost them a 60th overall pick. So I think the Kings had a really good day. And um, my loser of the week, and this has nothing to do with with me hating the team, because honestly, it's not even my top three most hated team in the league. The New York Islanders, 
have nothing to look back on in this draft and, and go, oh yeah, that's 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 really exciting. Yeah, their we knew that pick, with them trading their pick to Ottawa for Yeah, and, and this is and this is what happens when you go all in. You know, they traded their first round pick for the Zingle, uh no for uh Pajo. Their second round pick, I don't even know where the second round pick went, but their first pick was in the like 90, 90th or ninety first. Um so you cannot really expect much when when you when your first pick is that late. It's sort of comparable to the 2016 draft for the Rangers, where their first pick was I think 85th overall with or or 65th overall with Sean Day. Um, so if you hit one player in a draft where you only have like four or five picks after the third round, then then you should be lucky. But they shouldn't expect too much out of this draft. The value was in the first and second round and the early third. And the teams that had a lot of picks there, like Carolina, had a great draft. Honestly, Carolina. Very underrated draft by them. I, oh, I think yeah. them landing Jarvis, uh, that that in itself was great. I had Jarvis going them in our mock draft. Getting Gunler as well, I thought was fantastic. Uh, that that was probably one of the biggest steals of the draft. There are a lot of steals in this year's draft, but they really I, stood out I, I for would sure. Say, I would say the biggest steal of this draft is the Carolina Hurricanes in the fourth round picking up Zion Nebeck. Yeah, yeah, no. A lot of people thought Nebeck was going to go high, and as you mentioned before we started the video, him possibly even having first-round potential. So to land Nebeck, I believe they, they got him all the way at 115th in the fourth round. That that in itself was fantastic. They really they really stocked on their offense. Um, they got plenty of Europeans in this draft as well, which I thought was good. Um, when you also look at um Gain Vasily um um Panoramov, Panor I'm, yeah. I'm pronouncing his name wrong. Um, the another forward, I thought that was very strong as well. Um, yeah, no, they were one of the teams I think that came out of this draft fully out of all these rounds as one of the biggest winners. Um, another team that stands out to me as well, the Anaheim Ducks. Um, because the Ducks, even though I would have maybe liked them to take a forward at that sixth overall pick, they're so good with defensemen. They're going to continue to stick with what they're comfortable with. And they're bringing in a guy like Drysdale now who can really be that next big thing on the offensive front on defense. You know, Cam Fowler has done very solid for them for years offensively being a two-way defenseman. Same thing with Hampus Lindholm, among others. But with those guys having somewhat of an uncertain future with Anaheim, I think Lindholm especially, um, Drysdale going to come in in a couple years and he is really going to help them. Well, not just their defensive game, but their offense for sure. He really looks like another forward out there. And then getting Jacob Perot right towards the end of the draft. I thought that was a great move for them. Um, Pro even went a little bit farther than I was expecting at times. He went 27 to Anaheim, and that was very impressive for them as well. And then if you look at some other picks they had, they got um, Sam um, Colin, Colin Gallo. I'm so bad with these name pronunciations. Colangelo, is that what you said? Colangelo. Colangelo, okay. Um, the right winner. That was another solid pick by them as well. I really like their draft overall. And, you know, when it comes to Detroit, they were another team that I personally thought was a great winner. Getting, I love the fact that they got Raymond. I was ecstatic. I, I wasn't worried too much they would fall out of the top five. From all the reports I've seen, it really looked like he would go four. And I'm glad that I stuck with that. Um, I think Raymond is going to bring so much to the Detroit Red Wings um, without question. Um, I think the same thing can be said with a lot of the other guys that they picked in this year's draft. If you look at them, gain Wallander at 32. I thought that was a very strong pick for them as well to add to that defense because they 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 need defensive prospects. We all know this. Um, them gain also um, uh, Niederbach, um, the uh, the centerman. I thought that was solid as well. And if I'm just going down the list too, I really liked at number 55 when they got Cross Hannis. I really liked that pick to the forward. And then I know that they also got I'm Emil Vero at 70. I like that pick a lot for them. Um, Vero, I thought was going to go actually a little bit higher in the draft, so I'm I'm, I'm happy to see the um, Detroit get them. They got a lot of Swedes in this year's draft, and you know Detroit has been connected to Swedes and Russians through all their great runs. We know this, um, so I thought that was really nice. And then I think also when it comes to one other team that really stand out, it, like I mentioned earlier, it has to be Minnesota. Um, their first three picks are were like almost as oh, good yeah. as they yeah, can I mean get. Yeah, Lundell, Kuznodinov, and O'Rourke. That's that's slam dunk in the first. Oh, Rossi, I think you meant. Oh, sorry, sorry, Rossi. Uh, uh, sorry, Rossi, Kuznodinov, and O'Rourke. Oh that's yeah, no, that that was perfect. Dunk. Absolutely that's perfect. Dunk. Yeah, I it's it's so bizarre when it comes to the Wild too, and I'm not trying to um, mock them or any Wild fans watching this. I just. 
they're so suspect with the with the deals that they're making in themselves and what they've been doing, you know, over these past year plus. I'm um, really just trying to have an identity, trying to compete next year for the playoffs once again. I thought their draft was great. I just wish that their drafting could almost transition as good as, say, other managerial things that they do, especially with the likes of Garen. Um, they made a trade in the uh, the second day of the draft, obviously getting rid of Nick Coonan, which Cunnan I thought was really interesting. He's only 22 years old, and they give him up for the likes of Nick Benino. I believe Benino has a capita of over four mil still for at least another year. And I know that draft picks were part of this as well. But nonetheless, that was a very suspect trade because you bring in Benino. He's another guy who's really, at this point in his career, is still a bottom six type centerman slash wainer. I feel that Minnesota has a plethora of them at this point, at least what they've done this offseason. And with the likes of Buke's dad, among others, even Johan, uh, Johansson, even though, yes, he's more of a natural wainer than, this, than being a center. I'm not sure what the Wild are doing there, but I thought that they really did great when it comes to the draft overall. I love O'Rourke for them at 39, and even Damon Hunt, the other defenseman they drafted at 60-something overall. I thought that was great for them as well. So very impressed with the Wild. Um, the Devils, as I mentioned too, they just really stood out to me big time. I really like I, I really can't say enough good things about how well the Devils did in this year's draft. That first round, they took full advantage of it. Um, maybe you can make the argument for Shakir. But I know that for the most part, Shakir could end up turning into a solid defenseman at the NHL level. I'm not sure exactly what his ceiling is, but between the likes of Schneider and Holt, I mean, uh, Mercer and Holtz, it really doesn't get much better than that. Yeah. And regarding the Minnesota Wild, what they have coming up next year is interesting because from the Jason Zucker trade, they have the Pittsburgh Penguins first round pick. And since the Penguins deferred this year, that pick has no no longer has any conditions to it. So if the Penguins have a bad year, <laughs> that could become a lottery pick. And I know the Penguins have a really good team, but they, for some reason, think Matheson is a good defenseman. Okay, whatever. It's, it's uh, Rutherford. We shouldn't expect anything less at this point. I mean, yes. They are one injury away from, from having a really bad season, and the Metropolitan Division is not getting any easier either. No, it's if, been getting extremely tough over these past five years. The Rangers are getting better. The Devils are getting better. The Carolina Hurricanes are already better than the Penguins. In the my Flyers opinion. are looking much better under AV. Flyers, the Flyers are looking up. AV always gets them into the playoffs. He may not get a lot of done in the playoffs, but he always gets their te his team to the playoffs. Oh, yeah. He's a perfect placeholder coach for a team that is on the cusp of being um, in the playoffs, basically. You no. know, like if that roster is set in stone with those veterans and a good balance of some youth, don't count on AV for development. But when it comes to just having a good balance and mix of guys that are really hungry to make playoffs, A.V. just comes in there. He doesn't change his style much. He's like, all right, this is what we're doing night in and night out. And it'll ultimately reach you in the playoffs. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if the Penguins fall out of the top five in their own division. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, I'm not going to discount the Pens too much just because I feel like any and every time that I think about that, the Pens always prove me wrong. Um, if we look at what they did this past season, at least look at all the injuries that they faced throughout the season, you know, and um, I'm not I'm not trying to break down the pens or anything right now, but like they had a great season given all the injuries that they had. And even though, yes, they fell short in playoffs big time, it still goes to show that they're really hard to underestimate, especially while they still have Malkin and Crosby playing really well. But Malkin had a fantastic year. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if Malkin and Crosby play up to their potential for the whole season, then they can make the playoffs. But like I said, the division is not getting easier and they don't have their first round pick. So it'll be interesting for the Minnesota Wild to see what's going on there. And uh, they, they might get lucky next year. Who knows? And I want to mention, too, there were a couple of couple of other players that really stood out to me. Um, I think Montreal, for the most part, they... Their draft was a little up and down for me. I didn't dislike the pick with uh, Gouley at 16. I didn't love it either. Um, I didn't think that they needed to necessarily add another defenseman to that prospect pool. Um, and lie me, is Gouley a lefty or righty? I'm blanking at the moment. Uh, left, I think. I'm not 100% sure. Okay. Well, regardless, assuming he's left, and I apologize if we look like idiots for the people watching, but they already have some very strong um, lefty defensemen as it is with Romanov leading the way at this moment. Um, so it was a situation where I thought they really could have went for a winner. That would have made a lot of sense to me. That's why I had Gunler as a strong possibility for them, or even if, say, Mercer was available, um, which he was at the time. 
Um, what I thought that was surprising, but them getting Meshek, uh, right before the 50th overall pick was fantastic. I thought that is going to be one of the biggest steals of the draft from everything that I've seen. Uh, Poirier also falling as far as he did to the flames. Um, I'm trying, I'm trying to think exactly where he landed. Uh, he was him dropping that far was a like, I know he's a high risk, high reward type prospect when it comes to his defensive game, but he has all the potential. Um, if he really can round out his game defensively, um, the flames, I really like a lot of the picks the flames. They focus defensively. Uh, they went all in on defense. They drafted Kuznetsov as well. Another defenseman playing in the NCAA. And I believe he is the youngest player to join the NCAA for men since the likes of Zach Wierenski. Um, so that was very interesting as well. Um, I thought the Flames, as you mentioned, which not just Connor Zary, but among, the, among others, they had a very sneaky draft this year. And I thought they came out really good in the end. They are definitely an argument to be another winner here. Yeah, and and they they picked Poirier with the uh, third rounder they got from the Rangers, by the way, seventy second. Yes, um, and I can't believe uh, yeah. he fell that far. Uh, yeah, and and this is look, we go through this every year. Every oh, yeah. year we 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 think which players are going in the first round or maybe the second round. There's always like one or two who fall to the fourth and. There's always like that third round pick that everyone, everybody expects to go in the draft and that goes undrafted. You know, they, oh, it always happens. Um, but I think overall, there's a, there, there are quite a few teams that had a good draft. Some teams that could have done better. Um, I think the Rangers, to quickly touch on the Rangers overall draft this year, I think they had a good draft. I just think it could have been better. Um, I have no problem with any player they drafted in particular. It's not, not nothing against an individual player they drafted. I have more an issue with the players they left on the board. When, yeah. when, you, when you draft a goalie in the fourth round in uh, Garand, I have no problem with that because you signed Huska last year. You signed Wall this year. Uh, Lundqvist is bought out. Georgiev's not going to be here much longer. You need to, you know, refill that pipeline with goalies. I, I get that. I fully understand. And in the fourth round, Garand, usually I wouldn't have a problem with it. But when you have Nebeck still there, where you have Blake Biondi still there, I have a hard time justifying getting a goalie there. Um, yeah, Nebeck, that- not, them not landing Nebeck, not to cut you off. I just want to say how surprising that was to me. Um, because, you know, we know the Rangers, they love drafting guys, especially us. We, and the SHL, you know, they have great scouting down there. So yeah. them passing up on him for a goalie, nonetheless, they've done this for a couple of years now where they take a goalie or two, um, especially really since they started this retool. It's been evident. Um, even starting in the second round, I believe, with um, uh, Lindblom just a couple of years ago. Um, yeah. So it, it is it is interesting. I know that they love their goaltenders. It, it doesn't hurt to have them stacked up because at the end of the day, some of them are definitely going to come to fruition because with most goaltenders, you don't draft high for them. They just they something happens to them as they continue to develop. And before you know, it's like, bam, Shostorkin is a good pro, uh, product of that being drafted. I believe Shostorkin won the fourth round. Um, so You're correct. Yeah. In 2014. So it just, it just goes to show that, um, I'm not upset when any of the Rangers picks either as a Rangers fan. I, I really excited about Schneider truly, but I do agree completely that there were plenty of players even starting in that first round where I, I was scratching my head a little bit as to why exactly they went for these individual players. Not that they're bad by any means, just surprising yeah. more than anything. Yeah, and uh, the other thing, uh, just to quickly finish my, my thought here uh, regarding Garand, I hope he has a great career. He was the third best goalie in in my uh, draft looking at the goalies. So we get a good goalie in the fourth round. It's just the other guys that were still available. Eamon Powell was still on the board who went to the Tampa Bay Lightning, I think. Um, so overall, yeah, it's it's not a pick that upsets me. It's just not, It's also another pick that I'm really excited about because of what we left on the board. Uh, in the fifth round, they go with Evan Veerling and Brett Berard, who are two players I'm very excited about. Um, good centers. Um, they may not have that high skill upside, but uh, Brett Berard is going to the, uh, the Providence Fly- uh, Friars in the NCAA. High motor player, plays center. Um, he's a guy that, I mean, in terms of his his energy, reminds me a little bit of Ryan Callahan, but without without like the real physicality. Mm-hmm. Uh, he just never takes a shift off. Yeah, and, and which is and, which is great. It just hopes that yeah. he doesn't say die out too soon in that sense. 
It is, it is. Veerling, uh, they traded up uh, from the seventh round for him, I think. They traded two seventh round picks to the Sharks. Yeah, I like to get him, pick for them. To get him in the fifth round. I mean, we had three seventh round picks. Why not use them to, to get the player you want in round five? I mean, that makes perfect sense for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the final two picks, one I like and one I'm not really a fan of. And you might think because I'm wearing a Seattle Thunderbirds hat, I'm going to be really excited about Matt Rempe from the Seattle Thunderbirds. But I don't I don't honestly get that pick. And it has nothing to do with Rempe. It has nothing to do with team need. It has everything to do with the draft and the rules regarding NHL rights. When you draft a player from the CHL you get his rights for only two years. And in my opinion, when you get to the sixth or seventh round, that's just not enough. That's not enough time to objectively judge a player's development. And and in two years, they're going to have to make a decision. And we and sometimes it happens that a player, it doesn't get an entry-level contract and has to re-enter the draft. Um, there's, a, there's a pretty good opportunity. There's a pretty good chance that this guy two years from now has to re-enter the draft because the Rangers are not offering him a contract. Then in round seven, you have uh, Hugo Olas, the goalie from, from Sweden. And yeah, it's another goalie, but Chess Jorken was the second goalie we picked in a draft one. So getting two goalies is not always a bad thing. Uh, of course, the comparison with Henrik Lundqvist, because it's a Swedish goalie picked in the seventh round. I get it. But what I like about this is that you get a player from Europe, which means you get four years of NHL rights. In my opinion, in the sixth and seventh round, you go either with college players or European players because you get four years of exclusive NHL rights. That's that's how I would personally uh, target the sixth and seventh round prospects. Yeah, you know, th- and that's completely fair. And I think when you also look at um, not just with the Rangers, but with other teams in this year's draft, um, what I found a little bit, I shouldn't even say surprising, it's almost like I'm not surprised at this point. Um, let's take a moment to discuss the Toronto Maple Leafs here because uh, we, you were right when it came to their Russian scouting when we talked in the mock draft. You know That's why you had Shakir going there at 15, and they didn't take him, but they took Amarov, which is funny because in my mock draft, I had Amarov going to the Devils with that pick, I believe, or at least at the um, the 18th pick, one of those. So it was interesting to see them take Amirov. You know, he has a lot of potential, a lot of pure skill. Um, I'm, I'm excited to see what he does over these next couple of years developing. Um, I've, as you've touched on as well before, you having met him before, knowing that he speaks fluent English, I think is huge for him. It may not seem like a big deal to say the average person, but for especially a Russian player, nonetheless, transitioning. Um, oh, wait, you know what? Amirov doesn't play in the KHL, does he? Yeah, he does. Okay, yeah. okay. I was thinking about someone else then. Um, just transitioning from Russia itself or any part of Europe where you have a different intellect normally, it can be a barrier. You know, we know that with so many players, not just on the Rangers, but throughout the NHL. So that very well could lead to his transition quicker. And then you also look at the other picks for the Leafs. I found them somewhat surprising in the sense of, I believe out of the 11 picks they had, eight of them were of players that are currently playing. And they are also, none of them are over six foot one. I believe is from all the reporting that I saw. So they're not going big bodied, um, which is something that doesn't surprise me at all. They, they've got some very solid guys. I really like the centerman that they drafted, I believe out of Sweden, if my memory serves me correct. It was from Sweden or Finland. And their goal, um, their goaltending prospect, I thought was a solid pick as well. But it's another one of those things where they have so much skill in this lineup already. I know that these players take quite a bit to develop. I'm just not sure how I feel about their draft overall. I thought the first two rounds were very solid. I'm after that. I'm really feeling kind of up in the air. What are your thoughts? Um, it's interesting to see the Toronto Maple Leafs and New York Rangers going in exact opposite directions this draft. Yes. Um, the Rangers uh, picked the most Canadians in a single draft since 2005. It was the first time since 2015 they didn't draft anyone from Finland. Um, they only had two uh, two European players out of, I think, the nine that they drafted. Um, I, I don't want to say this is a changing of the guards. I, I think it's just the way things should, things things landed for them. Um, I do know that they had a, a, an overhaul of their scouting department when John Davidson came in. Uh, his son-in-law is now the director of North American Scouting, I believe. 
Uh, so there, there may have been a little bit more emphasis on North American scouting this year, but I think it's, uh, it's, it's magnified by the fact that the chips just fell in the way that they went for another North American, another one, another one, another one. And uh, for the, they, the, the goalie we talked about and then Oliver Tarnstrom, who they also got from Sweden, the only two European players. And then Toronto Maple Leafs uh, go the exact opposite. They go almost only European players and like three, two or three North Americans. And their players are relatively small where the Rangers have two players that are 6'8". Yeah. <laughs> the seventh round pick, they're 6'8". I mean, last year we had Adam Ekstrom, who I think was 6'4". Or six six. Yes, and he towered over everyone at the prospect development camp. I have a picture of him with the other Swedish guys. He looks like a dad taking his kids to skating practice. <laughs> You'll love to in see that it. picture. <laughs> in that picture, he's gonna look small compared to uh, compared to Rempe and Olas because they they are six eight and he's six six. So there there's definitely a different approach uh, for the Rangers compared to the Maple Leafs. I don't think it's necessarily a good or a bad thing. I think both teams just addressed something that they were missing yeah. in their prospect pool. Yeah, and I, I, um, it is going to be interesting when it comes to the Leafs going forward how they address this off season. Um, because I definitely think that they, I feel that I have a good understanding as to the moves they should make. It's just a matter of is Dubis going to really commit to buckling down defensively and a little bit more in that bottom six or not to really round out their game because they have all the potential. It's really about finding those pieces very similar to what the Tampa Bay Lightning did and having to give up some key draft picks or whatever it may be in the end, it will bode you well as long as you really have a CD playoff run in the end past that first round. But talking about some more teams here uh, before we wrap things up, um, I would like to also touch on the Winnipeg Jets. Um, I thought Cole Perfetti landing them at 10 was phenomenal. Uh, Lundell looked like a very solid pick for them as well. I absolutely love Lundell. We both admire the guy tremendously. Him going to Florida is huge for them. I love the fact that Sasha Barkov is going to really take him under his wing sooner rather than later, maybe even next year. I think that's awesome. Um, Lundell really has that potential to be something for the um, Florida Panthers that desperately need depth at the center position, might I add. Um, but going back to the Jets, similar situation. They need a 2C, and Cole, per- Cole Perfetti can really be that guy. And I think it really changes their direction to an extent this offseason. Um, when you look at the whole line A situation, if they say are trying to make a deal, if they're trying to get a 2C um, sooner rather than later, because you, know, you look at Columbus and the Flyers, for example, and I've thrown out hypotheticals as – um, the Flyers, maybe they could give up Morgan Frost as being that future 2C for the Jets. Or maybe it could be Foodie for the likes of Columbus being the future 2C and a deal for Line. So I think this changes a lot for them. I don't think that they were expecting to necessarily get Perfetti at 10. And they're like, wow, okay, he fell in our laps. We got him great. I thought they had a very solid draft overall. And I'm really happy with their picks there. Uh, Buffalo, I... um. Uh, I, I, Quinn isn't a bad player. He's arguably the best goal scorer in this draft, um, outside of the likes of Holtz. But with having all these guys available, with not just Rossi, but Perfetti and Lindell, the fact that they took Quinn is, uh, a little baffling to me. Um, just given the fact that, yes, their winger depth isn't great at all. And yes, they brought in Eric Stahl. So they have him and Cousins. You know, they do have some center depth, but it never hurts, especially with most players not making the league right away. Um, Rossi, you can make the argument. Perfetti, I'm not completely sold on yet. Um, so it, I'm just really baffled by Buffalo. Um, to say I'm really all that surprised would be um, a different story. But still, what are your thoughts on Jack Quinn going to Buffalo? Um, I mean, it's for them, it doesn't really matter if they go with a center or a winger because whoever they draft at eighth overall is going to need like a year before – they do anything for the team. Uh, but I do think adding Eric Stahl to the team makes a difference here. Then now they have Eichel and Stahl down the middle. Uh, and they probably are expecting Jack Quinn to, uh, to come in next season um, and, and start right away. Uh, uh, one more year in, in junior hockey and then straight to the NHL. I think that's their expectation. Uh, they did a similar thing with Middlestad a few, a few years ago. Um, I'm not sure what's what's happening there. If they yeah. think Middlestad is still going to make the team, but from what I have seen, I don't think he's going to be at the NHL for much longer. Um, so they're going to need to do something. But 
that high end center that they may have been looking for, they might not need that right now because they they did get Eric Stahl. And the rumors were that the Buffalo Sabres were willing to trade the eighth overall pick for a center, for a top six center that could help them out immediately. Once they traded Johansson for Eric Stahl, I think that fell through. Their plans changed, and that's when they hang, when they decided to hang on to their pick. Uh, Jack Wynn, yeah, I mean, you can make a case for his scoring in the OHL, but I made a case against it because he played with a lot of 20 and 21 year olds on his team in a league where the average age is six is is 17, 18. So um, I have my doubts about Jack Quinn, but to be fair, every player in that range has some questionable things that they need to work on. If, if, if a player doesn't have any question marks, he would be a top three pick and, and not fall to eighth overall. Yeah. And, and that, and that's completely fair too. Um, you know, I, I mentioned this before. I don't think Quinn is a complete product of, say, Rossi, for example. I really think he has some genuine goal-scoring talent on his resume. I like his game a lot. Um, I did expect him to go high in this year's draft. I just thought that a very similar situation like we touched with the Rangers and other other teams, obviously, where just given the players available, it just leaves you scratching your head at the end of the day, in my personal opinion. Um, but I think trying to figure out any other teams to really – pinpoint when it comes to how they're drafted if we look at the capitals real quick when it comes to Hendricks lapierre um we've talked about in the past how the caps have really been known for making some strong picks in the latter half of the first round because they've been contending in playoffs for so long um they haven't had high first round picks really much at all in quite some time so they get a guy lapierre again who yes he has three concussions over this past year but all the potential is there um it's just a matter of staying healthy we all know this uh, but i think the caps find themselves in a very similar situation than they did just not long ago with the likes of Connor McMichael. Uh, McMichael very well could be in the lineup sooner rather than later for the Caps. And LaPierre, he will definitely probably need, say, a a year or two at least in junior still. But nonetheless, this was a great move for the Caps, in my opinion. Um, Given the other players available at the time, I don't think that they could have done any better as long as he stays healthy. They Another huge steal, in my opinion, looking back down the road, say yeah. a couple of and, years. And this is, this is why teams trade up. They don't trade up because they want to, uh, they want to stop another team from getting a specific player. I heard some Ranger fans say, Oh, the Rangers traded up. So the devils couldn't get Schneider. No, the Rangers traded up because they wanted Braden Schneider. That's, that's it. That's reason. Number one, reason number two, and reason number three, there's a video of Jeff Gordon on the phone negotiating uh the deal to trade up yeah yeah and, and jd and all ecstatic about it john and davidson is sitting next to him and he's excited because this is the player they want and i think he was like yeah i think you said it too like 11th or 12th on their on their list when that guy's still there at 19 and uh, you don't think he's going to be there at 22 then yeah you you make the you make the trade you make the trade because you want the player. You don't make the trade because you want to annoy another team. Um, that's something I quickly wanted to say about trading up. The Capitals traded up to get Hendricks Lapierre because he was still sitting there at 22. Yep. The Calgary Flames were confident that they were still going to get their player at 24, I think. Yeah, they were banking on Zary, um, really, yeah. from the 19th pick. That's why they were like, all right, we can trade down a couple. And it, yeah, it worked so, out so, perfect. Yeah, so they, they, they traded down three spots and then they traded down another two spots. They added some some picks and they still got their guy. Perfect. Um, the one team that – this is the last team I'll, I'll, we'll probably talk about, but the Pittsburgh Penguins, in my opinion, did not really have a good draft. It's not a bad draft. It's just not a draft that's going to do a lot for them. Another team that drafted two goaltenders. Drafting two goaltenders is fine. Drafting two goaltenders with your first two picks in a draft? That, that Yeah, exactly. It's all about placement. This is the that, biggest thing. This isn't yeah. a shot at the players. You know, this really isn't for the Look, most part. Joe Blomquist was my second best goalie this draft behind Oskarov. Uh, he's going to be a really good goalie. But drafting him 52nd overall in the second round, you're going to have the same discussion as the Ranger fans had with Limbaugh. Even if everything works out, 
And and even if Joe Blomquist becomes a starting goalie in the NHL, his value will never be more than what you use to get him in the draft. His value will never be more than what it costs to get him. Um, the other goalie, Kalle Klang from Sweden, third round, 77 overall. Again, good goalie prospect, but you need something. You just traded your best center prospect to the Toronto Maple Leafs in a deal with the 15th overall pick for Kasperi Kapanen. You need to do something. You have a 52nd overall pick in a draft with a second round that has a lot of talent left still on the board. And just I'll quickly go to the second round here. The players drafted after them. Uh, I mean, there's there's uh, uh, Ponomarov who went to the Hurricanes right after Blomqvist. Emil Andre on defense. They get they have to need to replace Chris Letang eventually, and Matheson is not going to do it for them. Those those are the first two picks after Blomqvist, and I I like Blomqvist as a goalie, but he would not be my pick there. That's that's all I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, and um. Uh, that's exactly it. I was talking to a friend of mine earlier today as well, who's a Penguins fan regarding these two goaltenders. And um, it, it really is just the placement. Um, the Pens have fared well in the past, drafting the mid to later rounds for goaltenders. Tristan Jari and Murray would be perfect examples of that. But nonetheless, I, um, Rutherford is just, I, I'm not really going to expand on Rutherford much more, but we, we all know that he's made some very questionable moves over this past year or two, to say the least. And there really isn't much denying that at this point in time. Um, and then when you look at other teams here, if I'm just trying to think if there's really any other that stand out. Um, I like to mention too, the Devils gained Dawes. I thought that was great as well. I'm um, just adding as um, to the prospects that they got, getting that goaltending depth, I don't think hurts them at all. Um, I, do, I think what I found surprising from this draft, at least in the second round, or maybe it was just me, was the amount of Americans that were actually drafted um, from the U.S. National Development Team. I wasn't expecting as many players as we saw in that yeah. per, in that second round. I thought that was somewhat surprising. So the last thing I'll say uh, uh, as we wrap it up after that, the three winners when it comes to countries for me, uh, Sweden, Germany, and Austria. Uh, Sweden set a new record for players in a single draft. Yeah, that was awesome. Germany had a third overall pick, uh, a 17th overall pick, and a 34th, I think, Paterka. Which is huge. They had three history. players drafted in the first 34 picks. That's amazing. That's unheard of. Austria, for the first time in history, they had three players going in the draft, including Rossi in the top 10. That's I mean, those those are my three winners when it comes to countries: Sweden, Germany, and Austria. And um, not not even to uh, really um, drag this out, but I just want to say too, just thinking about Austria in itself, be kind of cool just for the whole Austrian connection. If the um, the Wild would possibly take a flyer on Grabner, putting their bottom six. Um. I mean, it's possible they 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 should have the cap space to buy to to sign a player that was bought out, and this is the thing: players who get bought out are usually very cheap. Oh, I know they're only going to take probably minimum, you know, anywhere between seven hundred and fifty k to nine twenty five. They still have to buy out money. Shattenkirk signs one year for one point five million to win a cup, and it works. It's brilliant. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean Grabner. To uh, I don't think Rossi's going to play for the Minnesota Wild immediately, so it might not be a thing that had that 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 would come to fruition right now. But um, yeah, it's interesting to see if he's going to play with any other Austrians. Yeah, uh, I I personally think Rossi has a very solid chance to be in the league next year, um, just because obviously given his age and also too just how dominant he's been at the junior level. I'm not sure how much more benefit he will get by, say, having another year of seasoning in juniors, and why would it really make sense for him to play in the AHL? He's one of those well, guys that really wouldn't stand out as an AHL product to me. The thing is, I, I think he, I don't think he's there on loan, so he cannot even play in the AHL. Oh, okay. Because uh, this is also, for Braden Schneider, important. Uh, Braden Schneider can only play in the AHL starting next year mm -hmm. because as a CHL player, you need to be 20 
uh, by the end of the calendar year of the season. Correct. Starting, or have played four full seasons in college hockey. So players that have exceptional status, like Sean Day, they usually have finished their fourth season by the time they're drafted. So they can, as a young or, or as a younger player, they only need one more season. They can go straight to the AHL. Uh, Braden Schneider turns 20 next year, which means based on his age, he'll be eligible uh, starting next year in the AHL. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and that and that's a very fair point as well. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens with Rossi and all these draft picks overall. As a whole, I was really happy with everything that happened. Um, like I said, some surprise picks for sure. Some guys that dropped in the second and third round that really, really caught me off guard. Um, I think I can't stress enough how much of a steal I think Mishek was for Montreal, Gunler for Carolina as well. Those just stand out absolutely huge to me, among others, and Poirier to the Flames. Um, I know that people feel very up in the air about him, but I just thought those in particular, along with there were plenty of other steals as well that we may have not touched on exactly in the video. But nonetheless, this was a very entertaining draft, a really long one. Never seen a draft like this before, but it was a lot of fun nonetheless. And I'm really excited to see how many of these players come out of this draft class to be in the league next year and really how interesting this Calder race is going to be. It's I'm ecstatic to see all this young talent hang the league. Yeah, and what I'm excited about is to 17 years from now look back on this draft and see if it actually stacks up with as the, one of the best three draft. Because the best draft in the last 30 years is probably still the draft in 2003. Yeah, I think I think that still holds true. So we'll see. Yeah. Yeah, well, awesome. Yeah, no, this was a great conversation. I hope everyone watched and said you guys enjoy this. Uh, this was a lot of fun. Um, Steve and I, I'm sure we will be doing some type of thing in the future as well, but it was great to talk about these prospects. Steven, can't thank you enough, especially given all your expertise. And especially, I think it's awesome for you, not just you were at the draft just recently as well, but you've also met a lot of these prospects and had some type of intimate relationship with them, you know, actually meeting them one-on-one, -on -one, interviews them on other things. I think that's just really cool for you especially seeing these guys come full circle you know because you met a lot of these guys before they hit the N the nhl we may be looking down especially for your sake 17 years later you're like oh my god i just met one of the best hockey players in recent if not nhl history like it's just a really cool thought knowing that you've been a part of that ride but i can't thank you enough again for um, being here on the channel it means a lot and if you would like to give of course your handles for your podcast and twitter again by all means go right for it I, uh, my Twitter handle is Tadboy underscore Steven. Uh, and when you go to my Twitter, on my in my bio, you can find the link to my uh, to my podcast under review. Okay. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much, Steven. And I will talk to you soon. All right.